Good morning. Welcome to Camarillo United Methodist Church. Thank you very much for the opportunity for being in communion with us this morning. Uh, also this morning, the flowers on the altar have been donated by Lisa Karawaki in memory of husband Mark T. Higgins. And at the end of the service today, please don't shut the computer down or the cell phone. Stay tuned because we have a series of interviews starting with Kay Friedrich on the history of our church. So if you want to know more about how this building was constructed, how we came about, just stay tuned and Kay Friedrich will explain a lot of things for you again right at the end of this service. Just stay tuned. Don't leave. Don't go anywhere. It'll uh, start itself right as soon as we are done with that. And guess what? Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Listen to another parable of Jesus about the weeds and the wheat. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Amen. This is the time for our children. As we come together, I have a little box that I want to show for our children. And um, Jesus tells us a story about the weeds and the wheat. Now. The thing about weeds and the wheat, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not a gardener, and so I don't know the difference. In fact, yesterday, we actually had a group out at the Friendship Garden doing some weeding, and I actually got to come out and uh, 
try to lend a hand there. And I brought with me a few things. Um, now, the thing with the, the weeding is that here I have a, a few things. And, you know, I'm suppo I was supposed to pull the, the, the weeds and, and leave the flowers alone. The problem is, if you've ever tried doing this, I don't know if you, know, you, you can tell the difference between a, a weed and a weed. For example, this one here, it looks like a flower, right? It kind of has a, a nice little uh, bud or yellow thing in the top. I'm not a gardener, so I have no idea what these are called. But, you know, this looks like a flower, right? But actually, this was, there were only a few of this um, planted in places, so I don't know if they're supposed to be there. Um, well, these things already kind of look withered out, and so I'm, I'm assuming these were weeds that I kind of collected. Uh, this one here is kind of prickly, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this is also a weed, but there were a whole bunch of these all around. And, and they were actually organized in a place. So again, what's a weed? And what's a wheat or a flower that's supposed to be in place? In fact, I, I got a, a, a lesson from Ms. Anna Benny. You know that she's a teacher, right? And she taught me the definition of a weed. And she told me that a weed is actually a regular plant that's just growing in a place where it's not supposed to. So in that sense, what's the difference between uh, this plant or that plant? Which, which one is a, is a weed? I'm not sure. In fact, I have some else, uh, other things here that it's not that easy to tell the difference. Um, I have a picture here of a couple flowers. Now, if you look at these flowers, they're, they're nice, wonderful purple flowers. How many of you like the, like the color purple? It's beautiful, right? But one of these is actually poisonous, and the other one is something that you can actually eat. Which one is it? I don't know, like I said. I'm not into gardening, so I have no idea which is which. But I think one of them is a violet, an African violet, which actually is edible. And the other one is a hydrangea or something that, of that sort, which is very common, and yet it's considered poisonous. But it's not just plants. How about things that are living like, like these? I have two bees here. Right now, they look sort of the same. Now, if the camera can zoom in, you can actually see closer these, these two bees. They look the same, right? They're both black and yellow, and uh, they have wings, and they have eyes, and, and more than four legs, which I'm not a fan of. But one of them is poisonous. One of them is a killer bee, while the other one is a regular honeybee. Which one is it? Can you tell the difference? I wouldn't know, except for the fact that I'm the one that printed this. So I can tell you which one it is. The one on top is a regular honeybee, but the one on the bottom is a killer bee. You don't want to be around killer bees, do you? Again, flowers, bees. How about people? Now here, I have uh, 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 a collage of several uh, f photographs of people. Now, some of them are actually criminals. Do you know which, who, who's whom? If you look really closely, can you tell the difference of who's a criminal and who's not? There's, it's hard to tell. I can't tell the difference. They're all smiling. In fact, that's what it, the, the, the story of the weed tells us. That Jesus tells us, you don't know what's a weed and which one's a wheat. So when the, um, the farmer, the workers in the field ask the farmer, should we pull out the, the, the weeds? Jesus said, no, just let them alone. Because in, if you accidentally pull out the wrong plant, you might pull out the wheat instead of the weed. In fact, some of these on, in this picture are actually ordained ministers. I don't know which one, right, by just looking at them. Who's an ordained minister? Who's a criminal? We can't tell the difference. In fact, it's not in our place to, to point fingers and try to figure out who's good or who's bad. That's in the hands of God. So I'm going to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Let's put our hands together, bow our heads. And you can repeat after me at home. Thank you, God, for the way in which you created the world. 
There is a lot of variety and diversity all around us. There are many different people. There are many different things. And all of them were created by you. And therefore, we trust you, O oh God, to teach us what may be good and what may be not so good. But in all things, may we trust you, especially when we look upon each other and to trust that your spirit works within them and that every child, every person is a child of you. We give you thanks and pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, if the camera would follow me, we're going to enter into a time of prayer. Even though we prayed already, um, we're going to take this time to pray for uh, the world around us and the lives in our congregation. So again, I invite you to join me in bowing our heads in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning, a people seeking your peace as well as your guidance, as we try to find ways to navigate through these challenging times in our society. Oh God, we give you thanks that, you are able, that we are able to worship over the internet, even in the midst of this continuing pandemic. As it has already been over four months since our, our community, our society, and our church has shut down, and our communities have not been able to gather physically, we pray, oh God, we pray, oh God, for your patience. For our patience grows thin, but with each growing number of new cases and the recent spike of infections, O oh Lord, we pray that you will help us. Keep us safe, O oh Lord. Help us to stay healthy. We lean upon your wisdom, O oh Lord, to guide us in making wise decisions for the welfare of all. As you have taught us through your Son, Jesus Christ, what it means to care for one another, especially for the most vulnerable in our society. May we consider the needs of those most at risk as we determine what our next steps may be as a church. As a community of faith, O oh Lord, we lift up in prayer for those in our congregation. We pray for Marlene Jones, that you surround her with your peace as she grieves the loss of her husband, Dale. We pray that you give her strength to endure through, through her pain, and she is reminded of your promise of resurrection and eternal life. We also lift up prayers for Chris Garlington's son-in-law, Eddie, as he grieves the loss of his father. May you give him strength and peace as well. May we all be comforted that we will all see those who have passed on before us in your eternal kingdom once again. We pray for strength for the, uh, Donna and the Lutz family as they manage continual care for Bob, as, uh, following, especially following his recent stroke. May your spirit be with them, giving them wisdom and peace. We also pray for Linda Sharp and Karen Roth as they begin chemotherapy this month. May you work through the doctors and the nurses in providing the care in which they need. We also lift up prayers for Marilyn Farwa as she recovers from her pacemaker implant. Give her, give her and Bert strength as they seek your comfort and peace. In all these ways and more, we lean upon your presence in our lives to give us the strength that we need to endure through these life's challenges. As there are other prayers that we hold deep within our hearts, O oh God, hear them now as we lift those prayers to you. Continue to watch over all of us and keep us strong in our faith in you, O oh Lord. Have mercy upon us as you forgive us of our failures and continue to shower your blessing upon us. We give you thanks for occasions of celebration, such as Ron and Everett's uh, 51st anniversary and the wonderful gathering which we had yesterday with our drive-in movie night. 
Help us to focus on those joyous moments in the midst of life's challenges. We give you thanks as we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taught us all to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We encourage you to either mail in your check uh, to the church with your offering, or go online to give uh, through our website portal. And for uh, others, if you have already set up automatic giving through your bank, we especially thank you uh, for doing that because that maximizes your gift to the church without incurring additional fees. There are many, there are still many, many needs in not only in, um, supporting the ministries of this church, but also in our community. And so we ask that you give generously to support the ministries of this church. Thank you.
Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 to 19. Hear the story of Jacob's encounter with God in a dream. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, gracious, loving God, we give you thanks once again as we come together uh, at this time. As we come together in, in worship, wherever we are, in our respective homes, in our respective places, even in, this midst of the, in the midst of this pandemic, to be together in the Spirit to worship you. We ask, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit be upon us, opening up our hearts and our minds and our ears to be receptive to what you have to say to us. And we pray that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, we looked at a parable of Jesus uh, as he talked about planting seeds. And today, well, today, as you heard in the parable of the first scripture that we um, looked at, uh, Jesus uh, talks about pulling weeds. They kind of go together, doesn't it? Planting seeds and pulling weeds. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a gardener. Give me something that you can plug in and runs in electricity, and that, I know what to do with that. But anything that uh, uh, has to do with, you know, growing, oh, I don't know, growing stuff, uh, dirt, and especially if it requires uh, creepy crawlies, uh, I have no idea. Bob Fierro realized that about me yesterday that I actually have black thumbs or brown thumbs or whatever that you call that. I have no skills in gardening. So yesterday I came out to help with the, the friendship garden that Linda Martin organized. And so I went up to Bob and said, well, here I am. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. And he told me, well, okay, just go, go over there, grab a shovel, and, and get a bunch of those uh, green-looking thing, plants, I guess, um, and to go dig a hole and to just drop it into the hole. You know, simple as that. Sounded simple, right? <laughs> well, I couldn't even do that. I, I tried stepping on the shovel to, you know, to get it to go into the dirt so I can dig it up. It, well, it didn't work, and, and so one of Bob's workers actually had to come and help me and I ended up just kind of watching him do the work. So what did I learn from yesterday's experience? Well, gardening is hard work. And just like other things in life, just because it's hard work, if you don't keep doing what you're supposed to, it makes even more hard work later on. A few years ago, I realized I, noticed, I realized that when um, in my previous church, I noticed that there were some bees, bees flying around, like those pictures there, right? Not the killer bees, but the regular honeybees. There were some bees flying around uh, the bushes in my previous church. And again, there were just a few of them, so I didn't really think about much of it. But slowly, little by little, the number of bees started to grow. 
And then one, one summer, suddenly there was this entire swarm of bees that covered our entire courtyard in front of our church. Well, come to, we, come to, we came to find out that the bees took residence in the attic and in the walls of our social hall, which required, of course, heavy mach machinery to come in to take apart the roof and the walls. I can tell you, th this is something that our uh, trustees of our churches love to do, right, to deal with. Not. No trustee you know, of any church wants to deal with things like that. But unfortunately, we had to. Why? Little problems grow. But that's almost like a parable about how things happen in our lives, isn't it? We let things go. We put things off. We want to ignore things that, that are hard work or inconvenient until disaster happen. And I'm not just talking about gardening, but life, relationships, neglected, families, family needs that are ignored. What happens? Those result in broken lives. In the gospel reading today, Jesus tells yet another parable about a man who goes, who sold, who sold good seed in his field. But he says that in the middle of the night, an enemy, whatever that means, right? Someone with a grudge, I guess, comes along and, and, and sows weed along, among the wheat. And soon when the wheat sprouted, so did the weeds. So the workers of the field asked the farmer if they, would pull, if they should go and pull the weeds. And the farmer says, no. Because if you try pulling the weeds, you end up uprooting the wheat as well. Like, like I said, I learned this yesterday. That's very true. Not only is it hard to tell the difference between a, a weed and, and a flower that's supposed to be where it's supposed to be, but when, when you pull on one of them, out comes the other as well. In fact, I had to kind of quickly shove the good plant back into the soil before Bob and, and Linda found out about it. But when the farmer, as he continues in the parable, let both of them, the weed and the wheat, grow together. And then in the end, first gather the wheat to be put into a barn, barn. But the weed will go into the furnace to be burned. Now that's kind of a scary parable, isn't it? If you really think about it, that's not, that doesn't sound like a nice parable to be thrown into the furnace. Just like the parable of the sower and the seeds last week, we naturally start thinking and asking the question about ourselves, which soul am I? Likewise, when we read this parable, we naturally start thinking, who's the wheat? And who's the weed? You know, who, who are the wheat that's valued by the farmer? And who are the, the weeds that's going to be burned in the furnace later on? You know, that kind of reading quickly leads us to this mentality of us versus them type of thinking and a determining of who is good and who is bad. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that kind of reading of this parable, it's not, quite, it's not really helpful at all. Nobody wants to be a weed that's going to end up in the furnace. And pointing fingers who looks like a weed or who's a wheat, it's not really in our place. So what do we do with this parable? Well, another way of looking at this story is not to think of weeds and, and wheat as individuals, but to contemplate what are the weeds in our lives. I know that we all struggle with continually fighting with weeds. For example, you know, I'm not great at um, maintaining a garden, but I do try to uh, make sure to maintain my well, vehicles, right? Our cars. If I neglect to keep track of my car maintenance schedule, I can tell you that I, I, I can tell by when I start driving my car. I start feeling it when I drive. The engine doesn't sound right. The car doesn't accelerate as well. And a bunch of other things, and the light starts to, you know, popping up everywhere. You know what I'm talking about, right? Things start going wrong. You know, I grew up with two older sisters, which I am thankful to God for them. Because, you know, well, first of all, they were really good at taking care of their little brother. But also, 
I learn by watching them and learning from their mistakes. Let me tell you a little story about my second sister, and I'm hoping that she's not watching this. So my second sister, um, when she got her first car, didn't realize that there's such, such a thing as engine oil. Sure, she took care of her wonderful brand new car by washing it and, and putting in gas whenever that gas light went on. But she went for a whole year without changing the oil. Now, you have to remember, this is back in, the, back in the 1980s when you're supposed to do it, what, every three months or so, right? Not like cars today, which amazing, you know, they go on forever. But back then, you're supposed to do that. Well, after a whole year, suddenly the car stopped in the middle of the highway. The engine just gave out because there, were, there was no more oil in, these, in the cylinders. And I can tell you, my father <laughs> was not happy, and it was a costly lesson. But talking about pulling weeds in the garden, cleaning out bees in the attic, and changing oil in the car, kind of it sounds like I'm, I'm talking about all kinds of things, right? It's like a mixed metaphor. But there is a central idea to all this, and you get it, right? There are things in life that need to be looked after. Because if we don't, disaster strikes. And what's more important that when um, what, what's more important is that when those uh, work of maintenance um, that needs to be dealt with, if they are not dealt with, you know, not just trivial things like cars and roofs and things like that, even though they are costly mistakes, there are other things in our lives that are, well, I could say, priceless. What are they? Things like relationships. There's a story about a mother and a daughter and how the mom taught the daughter, Carol, about the dangers of engaging in, I don't know, common teenage uh, misconducts, such as drugs and smoking. Carol's mother knew that she wouldn't be able to stop her daughter from experimenting if she just told her not to do it. So instead, the mom made a promise to Carol. She said that she would not stop her if she wanted to try it. But in exchange, and she said this very seriously, she said, if you want to try it, you have to make a promise to me that when you do try them, when you light up your first cigarette, you have to do it in front of me so that I know. Well, during Carol's teenage years, several of her friends began experimenting with different things, despite their parents' warning. But Carol's mother never broke her promise that she would allow Carol to try it if she so desired, but she had to do it in front of her. And she expected her daughter to honor her end of the bargain. Well, who really wants to do that, right? Who wants to do drugs or, or you know, smoke a cigarette in front of your parents? Carol's mom was pretty wise. But more, more importantly, she valued the relationship that allowed Carol to make her decision, but making sure that, she had to, that, that the mom would be there whenever she made those decisions. Well, as you can imagine, Carol never did drugs or smoke. It's been said that half of parents today don't know what their teenage children are doing after school or how they spend their time and how they spend their money. There are definitely weeds growing in the lives of families today. Weeds that need to be addressed. Weeds that need to be pulled. Our relationship with our children or family members is just one example of a weed that needs attention in our lives. But the most important relationship of all is, of course, our relationship with God. And some of us have weeds growing there. Isn't it true? We know. We don't pray as, as often as we should. We don't study the Bible as maybe we once did when we were younger. We don't rely on God's Spirit for guidance 
in our lives when we know that we should. Oftentimes, our lives resemble no different, no difference as one who has no faith in God or in Jesus Christ. And that weed continues to grow. The story of Jacob that we read in the second passage is exactly that. If you remember a little bit about Jacob's story, you know, Jacob is the son of Isaac, who is the son of father Abraham. So he comes from an, a very important faith heritage. But his life would tell you otherwise. He, he lived his life by the wits of his own you know, de deception. He stole the birthrights of, of his brother, lied to his father, and spent all his life attaining what he could by taking it from others. In fact, his name, Jacob, means, uh, it actually means grabber, to take things. You know, if I were to describe Jacob's character, he was actually a con artist. Yeah, if some of you remember that, that's who Jacob was. Who wants to be a con artist? No one, of course. Even though his grandfather, Abraham, is known for his faithfulness in trusting in God, Jacob was far from that. He trusted in his own wit, his own ingenuity, his own might, until he goes so far that he finds himself running away, running away from home, running away from his hometown. And the passage that we heard today, he's in the middle of nowhere with nothing but the tunic off his back. And he goes to sleep by putting a stone under his head. And you know that you hit rock bottom if, you know, you're using a rock as a pillow. But sometimes that's what it takes for us to that help, that makes us pay attention to what is important in our lives. And as Jacob sleeps, he dreams of a ladder that extends from the ground to heaven above with angels going up and down. And he realizes that even in his broken state, God is still there making a promise to him that if he puts his life in God's hands, God will take care of him. Well, that same promise is given to us as well. No matter what weeds that we may have growing in our lives, even if we consider ourselves to be a weed, the promise that God makes to us is that through his mercy and, his, and, and God's grace, if we stop neglecting our spiritual well-being, if we start listening to the Spirit of God nudging our hearts, and if we place our trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, our lives, our world, all that is truly important in our lives will start bearing fruit. God is still with us. And God will lead us to a harvest. But we need to start paying attention to the weeds in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Something God alone.
As uh, Louvi mentioned early um, at the beginning of the service, um, after the postlude, um, uh, we'll be show showing a short video with Kay Fiedrich, uh, who will be talking about the history of this church. So we want to encourage you, do not t tune away. We don't, don't turn off the computer. Uh, don't click away after the benediction, but stick around for this wonderful video with Kay. Now receive the benediction. Me the love of God, we invite you to pay attention in our spiritual well-being. May we trust in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that our lives reflect the work of the Holy Spirit, not only for us, but so that our communities may be transformed by God's presence. Amen. My name is Kay. My family and I came to Camarillo in 1965 and quickly discovered this church. Since then, my interests have been with United Methodist Women, Church Council, Caring Ministries, Membership, Memorials and Gifts, and Church History. This church was organized in 1953 using the little building at the intersection of Anacapa Drive and Catalina Drive. Later that year, five acres of land was purchased for future expansion at 291 Anacapa Drive. In 1954, two military barracks were purchased and joined together and converted to a chapel 
an office, a classroom with a kitchen in the corner between the buildings. Two years later, in 1956, a sanctuary complex was built, which included a sanctuary, now the uncarpeted area of Brooks Hall, a chancel area, now storage closets, sanctuary overflow room, which is now the kitchen, church offices, now the youth center, restrooms, now the bell choir director's office, and the parlor, which is now our library. In 1957, property at 333 Anacapa Drive with an existing house was purchased to be used as the parsonage. Our present sanctuary sits at the location of that parsonage. In 1961, property at 302 Mission Drive with small house and garage was purchased. The garage is now the medical supply building. In 1962, the Niche Hall classroom building was built, which included six classrooms, a nursery, and an office. In 1963, a daycare center was established for mission outreach. This is now our child development center. Then in 1971, at 300 Mission Drive, a new parsonage was built in just 90 days, mostly with volunteer labor. That building is now Mission House. The following year, 1972, Offices were built in what was a garden area next to the present library, along the covered walkway. The library was established in 1973 in one of the newly built offices, and books had been stored in a garage. In 1974, the original parsonage was sold and moved away, and the area was graded for our present sanctuary building. In 1975, the library was moved to its present location and dedicated to the librarian, Lillian Day. Our current sanctuary was completed in only 10 months, again using mostly volunteer labor. The project included the Howard Farner Chapel, offices, the stained glass windows that were German made, and the Manzanita Cross crafted by a church member, Jim Perkins. The following year, 1976, a new 21 rank Schantz pipe organ was installed in the new sanctuary. In 1979, an extension of the original sanctuary building, which now includes the carpeted area of Brooks Hall and Howell Parlor, and removal of the original restrooms and conversion to the bell director's office. Ten years later, in 1989, property at 363 Anacapa Drive was purchased. The block house was used as a rental. This is now Friendship Garden. In the early 1990s, the medical supply project was started with the cooperation of Camarillo Health Care District. In 1996, the information station was added, the fellowship patio outside Brooks Hall was built, old office walls were removed to enlarge the present youth center. Then, three years later, in 1999, the west parking lot was realigned and the little house on Mission Drive was removed. A restroom for the Child Development Center, room 13, was added and the front steps to the sanctuary were rebuilt. In 2000, the parsonage at 300 Mission Drive was converted to offices, meeting areas, and classrooms. The Japanese American Christian congregation began renting parts of the building. In 2002, the tall pole and memorial cross were removed from the front lawn due to termite damage. Eventually, the cross was attached to the outside wall of the church offices. In 2004, a pergola walkway was built across the parking lot to establish safer access to the opposite side of the campus. And in 2005, a new septic tank for Niche Hall and Brooks Hall was installed just inside Mission Drive entrance. 
This was due to a collapse of a part of the original system. In 2006, the Schantz pipe organ was digitally upgraded from the original 21 ranks of pipes with the addition of 31 digitally recorded ranks. In 2008, the house at 363 Anacapa was removed. The area was regraded and Friendship Garden was developed. In 2009, the Mission House building was remodeled with the addition of the Covenant Room Chapel and restroom. In 2014, the Dr. Jim Decker Mahan Memorial Garden was developed in the North Sanctuary patio. 2015, the Medical Supply Project was dedicated to former pastor Craig LeBreton. A new storage garage was built so all of the old garage could be available for medical supply equipment. In 2017, the sanctuary's west patio was remodeled with new concrete, a pergola, and landscaping around the edge. In 2019, the choir loft was removed along with the portion of the north side pew area to accommodate performance areas. And in 2020, the sanctuary closet was enlarged to accommodate bell choir equipment. We hope you have enjoyed this overview of the history of the Camarillo United Methodist Church.